Hello, my name is Dr. Yad. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we are talking about the pulmonary uh, neonatology series. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about pulmonary air leak in the newborn uh, age group. Pulmonary air leak, we're going to talk about pathophysiology, what are the risk factors, clinical presentation, and finally, we're going to talk about management approach of each pulmonary air leak. So we will start with the pathophysiology. Uh, as we know, each time we are talking about uh, anatomy, but we are never, uh, or we never discuss about the pulmonary interstitium. Pulmonary interstitium is the uh, scaffolding of the lung started from the, uh, it's made from the connective tissue that beginning from the lung helium all the way to the visceral pleura. When we discuss about the pulmonary air leak, we are covering five or six main uh, topics. Number one, we're gonna talk about the pneumothorax. Number two, we're gonna talk about the pneumomediastinum, pericardium, pulmonary interstitial emphysema. And then we're gonna talk about subcutaneous emphysema. And finally, and that's uh, in the GI series, we're gonna talk about the pulmonary or, uh, or the pneumoperitoneum. That means air in the peritoneal cavity. So where's the air come from? The source of the air, it could be from the rupture of the main airway, either from the trach or from the main bronchus. So that's one first source. It could be rupture in the alveoli, either the rupture of the alveolar uh, sac or the plips. Number three, it could be, comes from the, the air, come from the trauma or the uh, iatrogenic from the outside. The last organs that it might air come from if the estrogen rupture, estrogen tear. So again, it could feel right away, either trach or the uh, main bronchus. It could be a rupture from the alveoli, uh, it could be from external, from outside, iatrogenic post-surgery, or esophageal ruptures. Why newborn more likely to have airborne disease? On other, or air leak disease, or on other questions, or another way to ask is why the pneumothorax, which is one of the most common uh, air leak, uh, happen in the newborn, why it appear uh, commonly shortly after birth, we have a baby or transfer baby from other facility that uh, baby has respiratory distress, uh, x-ray done and uh, recognized baby has a pneumothorax. So why babies, they have pneumothorax. So before we explain why we need to know what's the hearing bro uh, reflex or the inflation deflation uh, reflex. So what happens in the babies during inspiration or expiration? So during inspiration, uh, that's baby shortly after birth, when the baby spread, the lung sustained, air or lung inflated, a good tidal volume, the smooth muscle receptors in the small and large airway get stimulated. So stimulate the receptors on the uh, large and uh, small airway. And that send the impulse through the vagus nerve all the way to respiratory centers. And that's trigger that already the lung start expanding. Then the, from the center come back, inhibit the airway or the habit respiration and then maybe slow breathing and uh, in very, very rare case, maybe even stop breathing. So uh, that's the normal. So baby has the ability in certain point when the lung starts uh, inflated, so the cerebral cannot go farther, so not continue baby inflate. So immediately when the lung starts inflated with certain tidal volume, then there's impulse gonna go through the vagus nerve that's uh, to the central, um, uh, to the brainstem, um, and from there it come back and uh, stop the breathing or inhibit the respiration. And the same during the deflation. When the lung is that deflated, uh, would it decrease the tidal volume to a certain uh, degree? Then it's going to send uh, the smooth muscle receptors in the small and airway, in the large airway. They get relaxed. Once they're relaxed, then it's going to stimulate the impulse uh, through the vagus nerve all the way to the respiratory center to initiate the respiration. 
Why that's important? Because when we have baby who has, or when the baby immediately after birth has some difficulty breathing, we place baby on the non-invasive CPAP or in, in IBVV. When we have the baby on that, usually we use the asynchronized CPAP or asynchronized uh, non-invasive um, ventilation. When we have asynchronous non-invasive ventilation, then we interfere with this that way because the lungs, certain point, it's supposed to stop or the inhibit the respiration, we continue to inflate it, and that's when the pneumothorax uh, most likely happens. And that's I'm talking about spontaneous pneumothorax when the lung is completely uh, normal. Also, in the children, usually uh, we have uh, babies who are the, in the children three to four years of age, um, and older, usually there's something called collateral ventilations. Collateral ventilation, that means in the alveoli itself, there is collaterals that uh, help equilibrium uh, pressure or distribute the air among uh, the alveoli. We have three type of the three different pathways of the collateral ventilation uh, between the two alveoli called intra-alveolar. We have the bronchobronco, or we have the bronchoalveolar uh, ventilation or channels of the Lambert, uh, okay? And we have the, the inter between two bronchus, uh, that's called the, that's called the uh, channel of the Martin. So that's called channel of Martin, channel of the Lambert, and then uh, we have the bore between the intra-alveolar channel. That's distribute or allow equal air distributed between the alveoli and minimize the pressures in one side of the alveoli. Unfortunately, babies or the premature or full-term baby, they don't have those channels that increase the risk of the pneumothorax. In the, so that's second uh, obvious cause. Okay, so the risk of the pulmonary air weak uh, or air leak uh, of the newborn, either pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, or pneumopericardium, uh, or the PIE, uh, or the subcutaneous emphysema, the risk factor, it could be issue or lung pathology. It could be ventilation induced or issue with respiratory support or it could be iatrogenic. So what's the lung pathology? And then we can discuss each one separate. So if you have a baby with respiratory distress syndrome, what happened with respiratory distress syndrome? Premature baby who has surfactant deficiency. What happens, what's the underlying cause of the RDS surfactant deficiency? When we have surfactant deficiency, what happened to the compliance? Our compliance is the low. So when we have a compliance, Low, and as we know, compliance is delta V over, delta V just uh, uh, remind each other. So when you have the low compliance, the lung or the need higher pressure in order to deliver tidal volume. So the, your alveoli, it become more unstable because of the lower compliance or because of the lack of surfactant. When you have low compliance, then what happens? The alveoli, it become very unstable and when the alveoli is unstable, either collapse, correct? At the other airway, maybe over distended. So that's the VQ mismatch, and that's the increased risk, especially if you baby place baby on the non-invasive support, then you try to inflate the unstable alveoli, and that's the risk for the pneumothorax. Good. Number two, it could be pneumonia, correct? What happened in the pneumonia? There's inflammatory markers, inflammatory markers, inflammation, exudate, and that's the damage, the alveolar uh, of the alveoli. There's a lot of inflammation, inflammatory markers, and then the tissue uh, get injured. And then when your baby plays and try to uh, ventilate the baby or oxygenate or try to deliver uh, a, resp a good respiratory support, try to uh, have a good gas, then what happens each time you try to go up, maybe still required higher oxygen, you try to go up in the sitting, and then you might, because of the lung is very fragile with the whole inflammation, you are at the risk of the pneumothorax. What else? If you have a baby with meconium, aspiration syndrome, correct? We discussed many times that when you have the airway and a right and left main bronchus and then bronchioles, so when you have those, when you have the alveoli, 
or when you have the meconium that um, sorry when you have the meconium that block the airway and create as a one-way valve what happens during inspiration inspiration is bronchial dilatation when it's bronchial dilatation the air goes inside and during expiration what happens during expiration so now the opposite during expiration is the bronchial construction so now what happened is the air starts trapping so inspiration air the bronchial dilatation expiration there is no way the air because bronchial construction and that uh, block the whole airway then we have air trapping when we try to ventilate the baby this air trapping increase to the point that maybe end up pneumothorax excellent what else when you have pulmonary i heard somebody said yes pulmonary hypoplasia correct pulmonary hypoplasia the same way baby the lung is already hypoplastic you try to open the lung and it doesn't open then you might end up and tetra and tetra diaphragmatic hernia all the other causes okay so any lung pathology any lung disease any cause that uh, the interfere or increase inflammation uh, create unstable alveoli might end up pneumothorax because we try to uh, baby has a vq mismatch we try to ventilate the baby and then may create and pneumothorax or pneumodiastinum or uh, tetra tetra or any of those air leak, uh, pulmonary air leak. Respiratory support. So what kind of that? Usually unsynchronized. Especially if you use the pressure mode. With high MAP. When we said MAP, that means delta B. High PIP. or high peep. Okay, so when you have baby on the pressure support mode or you are very high, each time you go up in the sitting, there is always chance of the pneumothorax. Sudden improvement in the lung compliance, another risk factor. Sudden improvement of lung compliance. What does it mean? Let's assume that you have baby with RTS. This baby, he's on the pressure support mode of ventilation. You, screw, you start a PIP 25 over 5 with the rate of 40. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, the oxygen requirement go up. You decided that you're going to give surfactant. So what happens when we give surfactant? The lung or the alveoli get you, what? The compliance, what happens to compliance? The compliance is improved. Once the compliance improves with the same kind of pressure, you, when you did not decrease the pressure, then what happens? You increase the pressure inside the alveoli, and there always chance of that pneumothorax. That's why we prefer volume over the pressure mode. So at least the the vo the, the pressure changing when the compliance improves, the pressure decrease. As we said early, the compliance equal to the delta V over delta P. So my compliance when my compliance improve, my pressure decrease if we are on the volume mode of ventilation. Excellent. So high MAP and sudden improve in compliance. Iatrogenic, like what? Like when you have the PDA ligation, especially if you do the old traditional way to uh, close the PDA. It could be in the tracheal tube. When you intubate the baby, there is always a risk of, especially if you use the stylet, there is always risk for the trach perforation or um, bronchial perforation if you are too deep. What else? If you use needle aspiration and tetra and tetra. So any procedures that happens from outside 
or any procedure like intubation, big line placement, there's always risk. Okay? Very good. We will talk about now pneumothorask. What's the pneumothorask? The pneumothorask is the air between the two layer or air inside the pleural cavity. So air in the pleural space. When the air escape to the pleural space, that's when we call pneumothorask. So as you can see, the lung covered by the layer or gelatinous layers. It has inside and outside layer. The inside layer we called visceral pneumothorask. Sorry, visceral um, pleura. From the outside, we, we called parietal pleura. There is space called the uh, pleura space. That pleura space has around 0.1 to 0.2 ml per kg of the fluid that slightly um, or the, uh, that have protein concentration of the less than 0.5 gram per deciliter. Okay, that help the it's a little bit. Um, um, that the space is very important to help the lung recoil. Okay, sounds good. Pneumothorax could be open or it could be closed. It could be something hole from outside or it could be rupture, the closed, that means from the inside. Spontaneous pneumothorax can be two types. We have spontaneous pneumothorax and we have a tension pneumothorax. Spontaneous pneumothorax could be primary, which is around one to two percent of the cause. There is no clear healthy infant, usually asymptomatic, or mild respiratory distress, no clear underlying cause, or secondary. Secondary to what to what we mentioned early: RDS, pneumonia, uh, meconium, and tetracycline. Secondary to the underlying cause. Spontaneous pneumothorax primary versus secondary, or we have a tension pneumothorax. Be aware of the tension pneumothorax, okay? We will discuss about it. So what's the risk factor for the pneumothorax? Either aspiration of the blood, meconium, amniotic fluid, lung disease, meconium aspiration syndrome, RDS, pulmonary interstitial epithema, hypoplasia of the lung, diaphragmatic hernia, pneumonia, ventilation, we discussed all these uh, options as any other risk factors. So uh, clinically, usually, as, a, as I said, if we are dealing with spontaneous pneumothorax, can be asymptomatic, or maybe as this picture can be presented with respiratory distress symptoms, as you can see, subcostal retraction, intercostal retraction, suprasternal, nasal flaring. Um, but if the baby get conditions get worse, or baby on the tension pneumothorax, then watch for the asymmetry of the chest in one side more than the other on the affected side. You can see decreased air entry on the, uh, that side, on the breath sounds, on the affected side. And also if the baby to the point that uh, he developed tension pneumothorax, the heart shifted to that away from the affected side. So what's the pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax manifestation? Usually sudden worsening, on the symptom, or if you have a baby already have spontaneous pneumothorax, then all of a sudden uh, either persisted or all of a sudden change his the respiratory status, then always be aware of that baby might have tension pneumothorax. As I said earlier, that in physical exam, you will note the decreased air entry on the affected side. And if you have a baby who already intubated, despite repositioning your, your depth of your tube, still the decreased air entry. Baby and the tension pneumothorax usually they are uh, usually they become cyanotic. These sets they are not responding to the oxygen. And if we are to the point that the heart start compressed, then you might have bradycardia, hypotension, and poor perfusion because of that squeeze on the heart. So tension pneumothorax is really life threatening condition. Um, large accumulation of the pressure intra thoracic uh, pressure. That's what happens, it's gonna push or the pressure that's gonna compress on the uh, central venous pressure. They're gonna decrease your venous return. When your venous return decrease, then you're gonna have kind of like the hypovolemic shock. So not hypovolemic cardiogenic shock picture with decreased cardiac output, hypotension, bradycardia, and hypoxemia. Also, it's very important to know uh, pneumothorax premature, especially very low birth weight baby who develop pneumothorax, those babies at risk of IVH. Again, 
elbow baby who developed pneumothorax, those babies at risk of the IVH due to decrease in the venous return, sudden drop in the venous return, or sudden in improve in the cerebral perfusion following the chest tube placement. Or because of the hypercabinia, baby on the tension pneumothorax might have respiratory uh, acidosis, high CO2. When you have high CO2, you increase the cerebral uh, perfusion, high CO2. Increase your cerebral perfusion. When sudden increase your cerebral perfusion, then uh, then you will have the risk, especially in tiny babies, of the IVH. Okay, so either secondary to the sudden drop in the venous return or sudden increase in cerebral blood flow. Also. Nemotorask babies increase the risk of the sudden inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormones. You are suspected baby with nemotorask, either sudden or, or a baby born with respiratory distress. When if you're differential diagnosed of nemotorask, then what you need to do at the bedside, uh, you can use the trans eliminator. Trans eliminator, which is the um, turn off the light and then take the transaminator and put it on the side where the pneumothorax is suspected. You can see the hyper or the increase, the light or redness. That's indicated there is air inside the uh, pleural space. Is it always diagnostic? No, because uh, we might have false negative or false positive. False negative if you have small, tiny pneumothorax that you cannot see it, or baby has the increased skin thickness, then you might not able to see it. False positive if you have outside subcutaneous edema or the lobar uh, emphysema or the pneumomediastinal, then it might be mixing pictures, okay? So anytime, if your baby is stable enough, is not in the point that tension pneumothorax, we have time, or the, the X-ray is ready, then the best way to diagnose by doing chest X-ray. So chest X-ray, either AB view, or if you still doubt, then you might order lateral decubitus X-ray, okay? And when you order lateral decubitus, make sure that the affected side, because it's air, so the affected side should be up, so the air can come all the way up on the surface, so you can have the X-ray and you should able to see it clearly, okay? So you can, uh, let's look at this image. You can see that's the, the, the lungs start collapse, and you can see that's all pneumothorax. And you can see the heart pushing, and that's typical tension pneumothorax, the heart pushing on the left side, hypoplasia of the lung, and you can see very, uh, that's less pneumothorax. You can see it's just tiny um, in this area. Um, you can see the pulmonary is very clear, a hypoplastic or the hypoplasia or the, the bush the, the lung on the other side, and you can see the heart, uh, but you can see that the, the, the airway is very clear, right, or left main bronchus. Okay, so two typical X-ray of the pneumothorax. So again, pneumothorax, if you are to the point that tension pneumothorax and you are in the delivery uh, room, then the treatment immediately stick your needle. Okay, especially if you are transhumanator at the OR and you are discovered that there's pneumothorax, then you need to stick your needle because to save baby, there's no time to place chest tube when discussed in management. Okay, so the management of pneumothorax, we divided into three uh, groups. Either the most common is the conservative, if we are on the spontaneous pneumothorax. If your baby is stable enough, he can maintain, or he or she can maintain the saturation. If we are not on the 100% oxygen, he required not too many, not too much oxygen. Uh, baby stable, although he's respiratory distress, you can monitor baby clinically. Um, if baby on the non-invasive, you need to decrease your pressure. If baby already intubated, you need to make sure the low lung volume strategy is possible, okay? So, uh, but as long as baby able to maintain his saturation, then just monitor baby clinically. You need to monitor vital signs, uh, very close, especially blood pressure, heart rate. And then uh, you need to do at least a mesh or two, follow up uh, x-rays, a uh, few hours after the first uh, x-ray and then the second day uh, as long as baby still in the ICU still in the monitor you can monitor baby clinically and that's what we do in majority of cases resolve spontaneously need one or two days okay 
as we said, usually one to two days, monitor clinically, and that's what they discover, and make sure, maybe on the vents, you need to decrease your MAP by reducing your PIP, PEEP, and the eye time, as long as, long as you have a good, uh, stable gas. And you are okay if, if your, your PCO2 is a little bit on the high side uh, in order to decrease your uh, pressure. So you adapt for hypercapnia as, uh, in order to uh, wean a little bit on your pressure. Nitrogen uh, wash or high oxygen, 100% oxygen, oxyhood, that, that although some centers still they use it, but uh, uh, it's no longer a uh, recommendation. The neonatal data suggests that nitrogen washout is ineffective uh, or method and expose baby to unnecessary to the hyperoxia. And that's, you can look at those uh, articles uh, as a reference, but uh, hyperoxia tests have been now almost uh, six years. Uh, I never uh, done it. And we just monitor baby clinically. If the baby anytime required all of a sudden change in the clinical status or required everything available, we are ready. And uh, let the nurse know that a chest tube should be available. A needle, if you need it, it, should be available at the bedside if you decided to intubate the baby. Uh, but uh, usually we monitor baby clinically, observe vital signs, blood pressure, x-rays. And if the moment that the nurse call you, they said baby is up on 100% or blood pressure start uh, down or heart rate all of a sudden start uh, going up and you know there is another tension, you might do another x-ray if baby is stable enough or if you know that you're at the point that tension all of a sudden stats is changing, then don't wait, please do not wait for x-ray. Just stick your needle or the chest tube. So again, the nitrogen, it's although still used uh, in some centers, it's uh, data suggested that it's ineffective and expose baby to unnecessary to the hyperoxia. Thoracosynthesis or needle aspiration, that's mainly if you are in the delivery room and there is some data also suggested that uh, using a needle aspiration decrease a chance of placing a chest tube. So you need uh, either um, 18, 20 gauge angiocatheter or a 20, uh, 20 to 22 uh, uh, butterfly needle. Um, Either one, it can be used as long as you connect it with the three-way uh, stopcock and uh, syringe, uh, 20 to 60 ml syringe. And if you, link, if you click on this link, you will see the procedures exactly uh, how to place the uh, needle aspiration. But very quick, your landmark, first you need to uh, make the baby angle, raise the chest a little bit to the angle. Uh, on the affected side should be up, and then use your landmark, either second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line on the affected side, again, second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, or if you decided to use the other landmark, which is fourth to fifth intercostal space, anterior axillary line. So how, how are you gonna get to that point? Use the nibble as a landmark, go all the way to the anterior axillary line, and then uh, intercostal space in between two ribs. That area, make sure you use the, the lower rib, stick the needle just above the lower rib. As if you're climbing the stair, I will step. one step. So always use that, your needle stick it on the lower upper part of the lower rib again upper part of the lower rib to avoid the neurovascular bundle okay and once you connect it with the syringe when you insert your needle make sure you try to aspirate and immediately you will feel the air come out that means you are in you have to stop so you insert it until you feel all of a sudden sudden release in the pressure if you place chest uh, needle or thoracosynthesis and then baby uh, improve immediately and shortly uh, reaccumulate or uh, decompensate, then you know that you need to place the chest tube or in the position where you already monitor the baby, uh, you know the lung is thick lung and then there's no point to stick the needle, then you might use the chest tube placement, okay? Um, the chest tube placement um, usually, um, the landmark we use, the fourth to fifth intercostal space, uh, anterior axillary line, you connect it with the um, waters, underwater seal. 
has continuous suction. In the tiny baby, we use pressure 10 to 15. In the full term, you might use the minus 20 centimeter worker, uh, water. We have three different types of the chest tube, the tradition chest tube, uh, which is a very uh, uncommon use in the United States, although there's some uh, physician, they still use it. Uh, there is widely use of the two commonly used in the United States. We have the pigtail, uh, which is we use eight to 10 French uh, chest tube, or you have the turkle. So again, the landmark, you need to use that. That's the lower rib, that's the upper lip. So you need to step, so what, so you need to stick your needle just above the lower rib to avoid the intercostal neurovascular bundle, okay? So as I said, we have the most commonly used, that, that's the called big tail because of the, the way it uh, looks like the tail, uh, it has a big tail. And the other one's called turkle. Uh, turkle, uh, it's the, if you look at here, it has a color, a green color. That means uh, that's the landmark for you. If you look at the tip of the turkle, it has the hole and it's very rectactile. Uh, uh, it's not needle. So when you try, what I what usually do, you don't have to, but uh, usually what I do, make small incision. So it make it easy for you to uh, place it, tiny incision in your landmark. And then you go as a screw. Okay, so you take your needle and screw it like this, okay? And until you feel like this, immediately when you touch the skin, this color changes to become red. Immediately, once you touch the skin, you try to insert it, this changing red. And once you reach the pleural cavity, the moment that you have reached all the relief of the pressure and you will see this color back to the green. Once you see the color come back to the green, that means you need to stop, you're already in the space. Again, so immediately before you insert it, the, the color is green. Once you touch the skin, the color change it to become red. And then you start screw, you start inserted your, uh, inserted your um, needle. And once the color was changing or you sudden feel sudden release, then you know that you are in and you need to bowl your uh, needle and leave the tube, make sure that you advance the tube so the holes, all the holes should be inside. The big tail also, it's multiple step process. And there is two videos you can watch how to do the chest tube by using turkle or the big tail placement. Once you connect it with the chest tube, then you need to connect it with the underwater seal. The principle of underwater seal is very important to understand, that's the most recent underwater seal but before we come to that we uh, to that uh, type of the or the sophisticated uh, underwater seal you need to understand where this principle come from so at the beginning the first they make just one bottles so it's made from one bottle or the tube connected with the chest tube with the with the baby all the way in the water two centimeter water and then just you need to watch that for bubbling. The issue with just one uh, bottle uh, models that when you have the, sometimes you have the serums, so you have you have the blood that might decrease the number of the bubbles or by block and give you a wrong impression that there's no more Nemo to rest. So then they make, uh, they adjust this one and they add another, they add another bottles now we have the two bottle system. The first bottle system, this one connected with the baby, blood drop come down and the air immediately go to this tube and then connect with the water seal to centimeter water. It was very good, but still if the pressure equilibrium between the patient and the bottles uh, become equilibrium, then nothing coming out, no more air coming out. And that's why they said, no, we need that somehow, we need a suction wall. And that's why they added the three bottle system. So the first bottle for the water seal, the second for the, or sorry, first for the collection bottle for the blood, the second for the water seal, the, the third for the suction. So again, the first, so here, there's always water is connected with the behind bottle of water. It has two centimeter water or two ml. You need, there, there's whole, this one, you can see it here. You connect it, you have the water, fill this chamber with two centimeter water, and then 
you need to connect your tube with the patient. So this goes immediately to the patient. And this one connected with suction after you, do, you filled with the uh, water. So the blood, if there's any blood, it's gonna come here and it's gonna be here. Air is gonna go all the way here. It's gonna be bubbling. And that's the area for the suction. You can see the balloon is already inflated. There's arrow here indicated that should be. And here the pressure you can see is minus 20. I need you to now to pay attention to the site with this one. You can see two centimeter water market, how much water we need. And you can see here there is markers, numbers, one, two, three, four, five. The purposes of this one, it's the for you to guide you how severity of the pneumothorax. So if you have a bubble all the way to the four, immediately then you need you, you know that there's a lot of pneumothorax. And then after hour or two, you come back and you see bubbles tell no more until market to the four, and now become only to three. You know the bubbles all the way to three, you know that the, the pneumothorax become less. And then you come back and you know it's only bubbles to number two, like now in this image, then you know that still pneumothorax, it's but less than before, until there is no more bubble. When you see no more bubble, you know that the, there's no more pneumothorax. The way we manage the baby, we place baby under a water seal, uh, we give him a couple of hours to 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours, and then until no more bubble. Once you see no more bubble, then you turn off the suction and then um, give him a couple of hours. If no, no more bubbles while the suction is off, then you know that uh, you can take off his chest tube. And in some places they clamp it uh, another few hours before completely remove the chest tube. So either you take off the suction, give him a couple of hours, six hours, if nothing there, then you, you know that there's no more you can take off the chest tube or you can clamp it for another couple of hours, three to four hours. If no more bubble, then you can, or baby is clinically remain stable, then you, you can take off the chest tube. Do we need to give sedation during? Some centers, yes, they use sedation. Uh, during, some no. Some they use baby, they place baby automatically, baby pneumothorax. They place baby on the maintenance drip of fentanyl, uh, morphine or, uh, uh, midazolam or Fersad. Some they place baby just BRN if needed. If baby required more than our scheduled dose, then you know that your baby required uh, more sedation. We have also acetaminophen IV. You can use it, uh, although it's not commonly used yet. That's the algorithm how to detect air leak. I will leave it for you guys to read it. Uh, so I'm not going to go in that. That's the detailed how you, uh, in case you have a, a troubleshooting, you can follow these guidelines. Nemo mediastinum. Nemo mediastinum, what does it mean? That means the air, Nemo means air, mediastinum in the mediastinum. What does mediastinum mean? Mediastinum means midway. So midway between two lungs. So that means this area, it's between two lungs. On the axial section. On the sagittal section between uh, midway between the sternum and vertebra. So that's all that's called Nemo. Uh, th sorry, that's called mediastinal area. Okay, you can see the anterior of the mediastinal and on the mediastinal wall, there is sternum. On the posterior, the main organs, you have the lower part of the thoracic. Uh, uh, aorta and you have the esophagus. Superior, you have the main vessels. Inferior, the lower of the heart or the base of the heart and the under the above the diaphragm. Okay, so you have anterior mediastinum, posterior mediastinum, superior mediastinum, inferior mediastinum. So, Nemo mediastinum, as I said, air inside the mediastinum. Majority of those, those babies asymptomatic. Why? Because rarely they go under tension. There's always multiple places. Their air spread everywhere. So it's not like in the pleural cavity where the, there is limit and then it has to push the heart and then, uh, sorry, lung and then uh, push the heart. 
If baby has a symptom, then he's gonna be uh, like any uh, other uh, pulmonary air leak. Baby is gonna be um, tachypneic, distressed, tachycardia, severe cases, you can have muffled heart sounds, um, cyanosis. Those conditions usually resolve spontaneously. When we do X-ray, you will know whether you are anterior mediastinal, posterior mediastinal, superior inferior mediastinal. As you can see here, we discussed in the early in the image, if you're gonna go back, that on the edema cystinum, there is thymus, correct? So you can see here the air pushing the thymus up. And that's the characteristic of the anterior mediastinal called spinkle uh, or spinnaker sign. So that's the, in this image, you can see the spinnaker cell sign, uh, very typical. And that's characteristic of the anterior mediastinum or pneumomediastinum. In the posterior mediastinum, if you find the, uh, or if you, you can see here, there is air under the heart. And that's give you a picture of the continue diaphragmatic sign. That means it's continuation. And you can see here, the, usually the lung is black. If you add this area black also, it's gonna be continue diaphragmatic sign. And that's indicated part inferior mediastinum nemo or pneumomediastinum and the inferior part. Okay, baby, as I said, usually uh, asymptomatic. If, even if the baby uh, has a symptoms, usually monitor clinically, place baby under respiratory support if needed, and manage as a baby with respiratory distress. Those pneumomediastinum usually take time and go by itself or resolve completely. The third part of the air, pulmonary air leak, the pneumopericardium. The pneumopericardium is a true emergency. It means the air or air leak in the into the pericardial sac. Typically occur in the infant who plays on mechanical ventilation, preterm baby on mechanical ventilation, who develop respiratory distress. Also sometimes baby either isolated finding as pneumopericardium or part of the pneumomediastinum, pneumothoracic or pulmonary interstitial emphysema. The symptoms is various, but you need to be aware of the cardiac tamponade symptoms when the heart completely compressed, because the, the heart is completely compressed, then baby is gonna have the cardiogenic shock-like symptoms. When the baby heart rate muffled, or severe respiratory distress, cyanotic uh, collapse, baby uh, capillary feeling time, prolonged capillary feeling time, uh, uh, prolonged capillary feeling time, hypotension, uh, bradycardia, so that's all the cardiac tamponade symptoms. If you do X-ray, um, again, this is the emergency. So if you have high suspicious of the uh, pneumopericard, do not wait for the X-ray. But if you do X-ray, you can see that the air all over the heart, surrounding the heart. You can see around continuation of the hair. It's not like the inferior um, pneumomediastinum just on the inferior part, but this one is the surrounding. And also second clue of the pericardium versus pneumomediastinum, you can see is nothing here. There's no limit. You can make a line in the upper, there's no errors. Third, if you do the, uh, if you positioning the baby and do another X-ray, where's the, um, the affected side up, then in the pericardium, it's the air is moving around. So if you move this baby around, you might see the air comes here, but in the pneumomediastinum, usually it stay the same. So that's the third clue. What's the sign of the cardiac tamponade? The sign of the cardiac tamponade, number one, as I said, hypotension, muffled heart sounds, uh, tachycardia or bradycardia, pulse paradoxicus, increased jugular venous pressure, and sometimes baby completely uh, pulseless uh, uh, electrical activity, completely collapse, and uh, and that could be air, or could be fluid. So if you have baby with high drops, they might be completely collapsed, no spontaneous breathing, cardiac arrest, or baby is already arrested, then you need to do the four resuscitation. Baby had cardiac tamponade, uh, sorry, baby has the high drops, then what you might think my baby might have also the, the fluid around the heart, but we are not talking about this right now. So pneumopericardium, that means just 
air around the pericardium, which is true emergency. So if you have the highest species, or if you have an X-ray and the confirmed use of species, uh, you know that you're gonna order X-ray is gonna come very fast and uh, you're ready in the unit, then you might uh, have an X-ray. Once you diagnose, then it's emergency. Don't wait for the ultrasound unless it's the, in the tertiary unit where the, you have available and you are expert, you know what you are looking for. Otherwise, just you need to stick your needle. The, your landmark exipoids process just below the exipoids process, and you need to use the same butterfly that we used for the pneumothorax, uh, connected with the uh, three-way stopcock, and from one side is connected with the syringe, 20 to 60 ml syringe, and you go toward the heart, perpendicular, and you can you go until you see the air coming out from your tube or film syringe. The fourth topic is about pulmonary interstitial emphysema. Pulmonary interstitial emphysema, that means this air leak in the interstitium. We discussed about the interstitium of the lung is made from connective tissue, from the helia of the lung all the way to the visceral pleura. When the air starts, when the alveoli start leak or rupture, the air go, go all the way outside and stay outside in the interstitial space. That's when we have the PIE. Okay, there is two risk factors for PAE. Number one, when you have a low compliance. So low lung compliance, especially in the baby premature baby, uh, when you have the RDS, when the compliance is affected low, and then baby already on the ventilation, you over the stent, over the stension. So over the stension of the lung and uh, low compliance, that increase the risk of the PAE. Additional risk factors for the PIE, which is very important, especially the premature. Why the PIE does not happen that common in the full term baby? Usually, the disease would happen in the premature baby because the very vascular connective tissue in the parenchyma or in the tissue connective tissue it's more abundant and less dis dissective in preterm than old infant. So it's more connective tissue and let's dissect it so the air is not get absorbed. So that's why it stay more. So that's the unit and that's the multiple alveoli. Unfortunately, it's gonna stay here, the air bubble. And what happens the, in, when you have this alveoli, when you have this alveoli, and then what happens when you have bubbles air, air it's prevent the alveoli from distension. So there's no way the alveoli to distend it. And each time the alveoli start, uh, you want to inflate the alveoli, there's no way because the bubbles preventing the alveoli from distension. Also, it's compression on the vascular. So there's no, uh, it's gonna affect your gas, uh, uh, VR, or they're gonna cause VQ mismatch. Ventilation oxygenation issue, okay? And that's the very close, uh, closed loop cycle we will discuss. So usually it happens in the, during the first 96 hours of life, um, an acute of less than seven days. It can be in the entire uh, one side of the whole lung. It might be localized, it might be generalized. So it could be unilateral, bilateral, localized and generalized. If you do, if you do X-ray on the BIE, or before we go to the X-ray, what the pathogenesis, what happens? So we said the interstitium, air collected interstitium because of the more connective tissue in the premature, more abundant connective tissue, less dissected. And number two, the premature baby, uh, they have low compliance. And majority of tiny babies, especially the elbow or very low birth weight baby, usually they are mechanical ventilation and there's increased risk of the over distension of alveoli. Okay, so the air that around the alveoli, when the air around the alveoli, sometimes what happens, those alveoli air, it's get together and cause or make the big bubbles called nematocele. And that's compressed on the small airway that usually here. So there's always, uh, there's some capillary blood vessel around for the gas exchange. If you have big bubbles, it might compress on the small airway and vessels. And that's caused VQ mismatch. And that's from the VQ mismatch, you might have the worsening blood gas. When you have worsening blood gas, then what you're gonna do? Unfortunately, if you don't know the underlying cause or pathophysiology, then you go up on your pressure. 
you go up your your breath, your pressure and you already there's leak or damage your alveoli then you can have more air get out of the alveoli outside to the interstitium then more air leak more air leak more v cube smash and then you are in the closed loop cycle when you do chest x-ray the first when you look at the x-ray always always that's my advice every time we look at the x-ray we need to take advantage take opportunity uh, when we read the x-ray to just a reminder so when you read x-ray always number one uh, that's a chest x-ray you can see um, baby already intubated, so you're gonna look at the lines. So baby number one intubated. You can see, uh, although I don't know if it's clear or not, that's your carina. So the tube between the clavicle and the carina, that's the good position. So number one, your tube in the good position. Number two, I don't know if it's clear for you guys uh, or no. Sorry. The Big line, baby had the big line, but the big line end up only here. So this non-central big line. What else? Number three, I cannot say that NG tube. So baby, this baby intubated, he should have that or she should have that feeding tube. Correct? There's no OG or NG. Usually those uh, they have the um, OG tube. Baby doesn't have it. Correct? Yes. What else? Then you can see the heart is there a little bit on the left side. And then you can point out now the lung. The lung, first you need to count how many ribs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten ribs. You can see it's already the diaphragm you already flat. You can see from these lip ribs versus these lips almost parallel. So that's the lung. It's already hyper expansion on the right side. Also, let's take off all this and you can see exactly the PIE picture. You can see there's bubble here, there's circle here, there's circle here, there's circle here. So that's the a lot of the PIE like picture. Okay, so that's typical pulmonary interstitial emphysema. Another X-ray, very hazy lung. You can see it looks like RDS or beginning of the chronic lung disease X-ray. Uh, but you can see it's there. There's bubbles, air bubbles, cystic. Okay, like. Baby already intubated. This baby has already NG tube. Correct. And you can see the diaphragm slightly flat. You can see it's already the lung tried to expand it. So this typical PAE. The management of the pulmonary interstitial emphysema is usually supportive. You need to make sure that if baby already baby intubated, you need to make sure that you decrease your uh, tidal volume or pressure if you are in the pressure mode or tidal volume if you are on the volume mode uh, ventilation. The best strategy, uh, um, most of the center they used uh, place baby on the high frequency where you can increase the map and help VQ without um, increasing your um, tip. And then also you need to minimize your suction and hang uh, or chest tube, uh, sorry, chest physiotherapy. So you need to manage baby uh, conservative. The main goal is to decrease your delta B. Pip, peep, I type. Okay? But the, when we said delta B, mean mainly pip and peep. If you have baby with persistent PIE in one affected side, uh, in addition to the uh, positioning the baby on the affected side, so affected side should be lower or down. Um, if you have unilateral, you should place that baby uh, or the uh, baby on that side so you can compress on the, those bubbles or the air. Uh, also, you need to avoid the suction, multiple suction. You need to avoid the uh, or minimum uh, chest physiotherapy. 
if those bear, bubbles make very big nematocele, very, very, very big nematocele that whenever the whole conserve that you did doesn't work and maybe worsening respiratory acidosis, then you might uh, some center they, uh, although it's not commonly, some center they do uh, selective uh, intubation to the uh, an up affected site or they block the entire uh, or collapse the affected lung by using selective bronchial uh, intubation or occlusion using the swan can catheter. Finally, the subcutaneous emphysema. Subcutaneous emphysema typically occur as you can see uh, face and the neck uh, or the subscapular region. Uh, you can see the air very clear. Usually they diagnose clinically uh, and then you can do radiologically clinically by the cribbits detected on the palpation. That's very clue signs. When you touch there, you can see area swallow. When you put your finger, you can feel there's a cribitus. Uh, usually uh, clinically has no clinical significance. Uh, exhibit a very, 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 very large uh, uh, air that block the air entire airway in the neck and that bush the everything and block the airway then uh, you might uh, intubate the baby if there is no way to intubate them it's very difficult intubation divide despite what you did then unfortunately you need to do the uh, tracker okay so again um pie pulmonary interstitial emphysema it's the relatively common uh, especially if you are in the level four Take you where you are dealing with uh, uh, very tiny babies. Uh, under the pulmonary air leak, number one, pneumothorax, number two, pneumomediastinum, number three, we discussed the pneumopericardium, number four, the pulmonary interstitial emphysema, number five, subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, from those, uh, tension pneumothorax and uh, pneumopericardium, they are true emergency, you need to learn uh, or you need to know how to manage those babies. Uh, the widely common, uh, we see it in the, when we manage microbremi baby, the pulmonary interstitial emphysema. Pulmonary interstitial emphysema, you need to know the why we have the pulmonary interstitial emphysema, what the underlying cause and how, what's the diagnostic and how to prevent it, okay? Any question? Um, any question? Okay. Thank you so much.